Thank you for joining us for this discussion of reparations from Baha'i perspectives. Uh, the conversation that we'll engage in here is in large part the fruit of study and consultation that have taken place among members of the ABS Africana Studies Working Group. I'm Derek Smith, and I'm joined by Drs. June Thomas and Guy Mount. And today we are representing for our working group collaborators who have primarily been Jerry Peak, Val Carnegie, Leili Maparayan, Louis Venters, Sahar Satarzadeh, and Jamar Wheeler. And over the course of the last year, our group has had the opportunity to meet on a monthly basis in order to walk a path toward unity of thought regarding discourse on reparations. And in order for us to walk this path, we engage in a series or engage with a series of key texts uh, in the discourse representing a variety of what we might call Africana perspectives on reparations. And in our discussions of these texts, we employed a kind of like a sifting methodology in which we made efforts to analyze the discourse in light of insights from Baha'i writings and community experience. And we developed small writing pieces that are actually going to contribute uh, to the, what we could call the curriculum of an ABS weekend seminar on reparations that will take place this summer. And so all these efforts, the consultation of the working group, the summer seminar, and even this presentation are part of a general learning process, I would say, that's being cultivated by the Association uh, for Baha'i Studies. Uh, in a 2013 letter, the Universal House of Justice offered guidance to the association in which it was in which it suggested uh, that that intellectual inquiry could be advanced through pointed attention to collaborative initiatives. And I'll read the specific language of the uh, House of Justice in, in this regard. They say, a number of small seminars could be held to assist individuals from certain professions or academic disciplines to examine some aspect of the discourse of their field. Specific topics could be selected and a group of participants with experience could share articles, prepare papers, and consult on contemporary perspectives and related Baha'i concepts. Special interest groups such as philosophy or religious studies could have gatherings to intensify their efforts. Periodic communications or follow-up meetings could be arranged to increase the effectiveness of the participation of these groups of individuals in aspects of the discourse in their chosen fields, end quote. And so, you know, what we're sharing today reflects a modest effort by the Africana Studies Working Group to respond to this guidance. And in the past year, we've organized our efforts around the reparations discourse, uh, in part because the Universal House of Justice has recently e explained that um, the Baha'i community needs to be able to offer, quote, uh, as a unified body, its considered perspective on issues that weigh on the minds and spirits of those with whom it interacts, end quote. And so today, you know, we felt that, you know, many minds and spirits are considering the issue of reparations. And our working group hopes to contribute to the development of a, you know, a considered Baha'i perspective on that issue. And of course, the ideas that we're presenting here are not meant to be definitive and they don't represent a Baha'i stance on reparations. Rather, they're reflections that have in part emerged from our working group and, and, and may be helpful to others as they think through the reparations discourse. And, and with that, you know, I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Thomas to sort of share some of her thoughts that came out of our process. Thanks, June. So thanks, Derek. First of all, it has been a wonderful opportunity to meet with like-minded scholars over a year and to talk about this issue. I would like to point out that not all of us are experts in reparations, but I think what unified us was a decided devotion to the idea of social justice, especially for people of African descent. And what some of us have been doing for most of our professional lives is writing about injustice or thinking about that or working with people as counselors or therapists who are traumatized by that. 
So to bring us together in a group with people who are conscious of the importance of interpreting current events and current challenges from the perspective of the Baha'i revelation was really refreshing. And I very much appreciated that. In addition, we were able to educate ourselves about a really pivotal issue, which is given all of this injustice that African-American people have suffered, what about reparations? Or what can we do in terms of reparative justice? And so that's what we've been focused on. But from the perspective of how does this play out from the, the, the insights that we gain from the Baha'i revelation? So uh, just a couple of words about what the dialogue is. There are people that have been working for years on this idea of the need to pay reparations or to compensate in some way, emotional or in terms of reconciliation. Those who have lived their lives handicapped in some way by the legacy of um, enslavement. So um, we, we read some of those sources. We talked about uh, what their ideas were. And I'd just like to cover just a couple of those people and uh, just kind of explain what they're saying. And then we can go on to talk about what are some of the shortcomings as well. Um, for example, there is a, a well-known scholar who published an essay in 2014, which actually won a national prize. And in this essay, he said, that reparations was an extremely important topic and that the nation needed to, to figure out how to uh, compensate for all of the suffering that African-Americans had been subject to over the last 150 odd years or 300 years actually. So um, this essay was extremely moving. It was published in the Atlantic Monthly. It began to generate a small audience of people who were not scholars, but interested in this topic. And it's possible that 2014 essay was really important in terms of getting the attention of the average American citizen to this topic. Um, the stories were very affecting about people and communities that had suffered over the years, such as those that had suffered from massacres. And it was, it was really a wonderful piece. I think one of the issues that we discussed after we read that piece was the limitation of the kind of reparation that's addressed in such pieces. So this idea of, are we really talking about material compensation for what has been a huge loss, not just physically and materially, but also in terms of emotions, in terms of psychology, in terms of family strength, so many different factors. So that was one of the first things we discussed was, can we really rely on this limited perspective even though it's popularizing a very just cause, can we really rely on their interpretation of what is a just cause? Another person, another scholar that has been very active in this field has been William Darity. William Darity is probably one of the best known scholars of reparations except for a few of us, not many of us were uh, familiar with his work. I'm sure a guy was, but not everyone was. Um, but that was very illuminating for me. He, among other things, explained that reparations should at least look at several phases of injustice. One is the phase of enslavement, the other is the effects of Jim Crow um, or legalized racial segregation. And the third is general discrimination. 
So that was very helpful because that helps us to see that there are different levels. So when people talk about compensation for enslavement, that's only a part of the problem. And so that has limitations. I really appreciated that discussion and some of the other discussions because in my own work as an urban planner, I have been aware of and thinking about and writing about injustices such as the Federal Home Administration loans or the HOLC loans, which discriminated against homeowners or urban renewal, which cleared out black communities. That was the stuff of injustice from my own field. But I think this particular investigation really broadened my insights into what really was the problem because it talked about things such as the Tulsa massacre, the 100 or so other massacres that took place in the years after the Civil War, um, the Social Security program, which I had not thought about, um, these other, these, the, new, the other New Deal programs. So it broadened my perspective in terms of the nature of injustice, but it didn't answer this question, what do we need to do that is genuine reform? What does the what does Baha'u'llah's revelation tell us about the limitations of material compensation? And what should we be doing instead? So that's a few, maybe just a few ideas. And um, maybe uh, Derek could talk to us a little bit more about Baha'u'llah's vision. Thanks so much, June. Um, you know, as as you mentioned, I feel you know somewhat similar to you in that I don't think of myself as being deeply studied on the on the issue of reparations. Um, but you know, in in consultations of the working group, you know, I felt as though I was able really to develop a few thoughts, particularly on like popular discourse on reparations and how they can be considered. Uh, from a Baha'i perspective. And, you know, our, our consultations around the pieces that you mentioned from Coates and from Darity, um, you know, helped me to sort of consider some of these things. Um, and, and one thing, you know, especially when you're reading someone like Coates is that uh, it occurred to me that even for those who are deeply in favor or deeply opposed to reparations, uh, I, I feel like there's little discussion of practical questions of implementation you know, like, how do you actually uh, carry this out? And I think that that's okay, right? Um, and for now, maybe, you know, the discourse primarily in the popular realm resolve, revolves around um, the concept of rep reparations of self. And like, from, um, from an Africana perspective, uh, a lot of that discourse involves demonstration that justice, which of course is a foundational principle of the revelation of Baha'u'llah, uh, that justice warrants that reparations should be paid to the descendants of those who have endured grievous harms in the making of the new world and in the making of America in particular. Uh, so from a Baha'i perspective, it seems that we need to think about this relationship between justice and harm and, con uh, and historical harm and contemporary restitution. And so one of the texts that came to light in our consultation uh, it, it, around these issues was Baha'u'llah's tablet on the right of the people. And now this is a really fascinating text that hasn't been authoritatively translated into English, but which deals with principles of individual rights and justice. And, and in it, Baha'u'llah offers a really interesting, fascinating example of an individual who steals the seeds of another. And the person who has committed the theft then plants those seeds and then those seeds grow into fruitful trees. And Baha'u'llah indicates that a just ruler would look at that situation and surely say that the fruit of the abundant tree uh, that is owned by the individual who stole the seeds, that those fruit are actually owed to the person from whom the seeds were stolen, right? And so for those interested in the reparations discourse, it's an intriguing tablet because the stolen seeds might be considered a powerful analogy for the stolen labor of enslaved Africans and their descendants in America. And one might say that the fruit of the stolen labor 
uh, of that stolen labor of African people and African descendants in America has been prodigious. And the justice then demands that some large portion of that fruit should be returned to the descendants of those whose labor was robbed. However, right, I, it should be pointed out that the tablet of the right of people has a deeply spiritual dimension also, right? And it encourages us to think about the possibility of spiritual restitution and the possibility that material harms could be repaired through spiritual means. And these, as, as June was alluding to, these were important elements in our consultation, some things that we've been still working with and thinking through. Uh, and also I should point out that in the tablet of the right of the people, Baha'u'llah is addressing the uh, rights of individuals and not necessarily communities. And of course, says nothing about the right of communities whose ancestors have experienced unjust deprivation and oppression. But all that said, the tablet of the rights of individuals is a really valuable source for those who want to learn about, you know, what kind of distinctive contributions could Baha'is make to the perspective, uh, uh, to the discourse on, on reparations. And, and I'll just a couple more thoughts. And in our consultations, one of the things that emerged for me was like the limitation of popular American discourse on repar reparations in that much of that discourse is limited to the boundary of the nation state, meaning that although this historical harm of new world colonization and the enslavement projects that went along with that were hemispheric or global in scope, uh, reparation in America tends to put aside that fact and 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 uh, you know put aside that and and not think so much about the fact that harms of the past are being experienced acutely by descendants of enslaved people in South America and the Caribbean and in uh, parts of Africa that were you know uh, colonized um, and so forth. And so while it may be pragmatic to think about reparations projects by beginning with the political unit of the nation from a conceptual standpoint. It seems that we can't think seriously about reparations without thinking about those who bear the brunt of historical harms in places beyond American borders. And so some of the reading that we did in that vein came from uh, important historians like uh, Gerald Horn and then other people who, uh, you know, who are thinking about reparations from the Caribbean and the African uh, perspective. You know, so that was really illuminating for me. And of course, once we start to think on the global level, once we start to honor the idea that you know, there is some merit to reparations and it might be global in scope, right? Then we come to realize how massive the project of true reparations might be. We start to realize that deep justice would require basically a reordering of political and economic relations between nations. And for me, this then points to the need of what some scholars are starting to, 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 to call world building projects. And so what was exciting for me was to come across, you, you know, uh, uh, people who are doing work um, at the foremost of the reparations thinking who truly recognize the need for a new world order. And I thought that this was very uh, uh, resonant with Baha'i conceptions and in fact, um, so, so one of the scholars that really stood out to me was that they, they came and I came upon in consultation with one of the other members in the in the working group um, was uh, Femi Taiwo, and he has this book called Reconsidering Reparations, which thinks about the intersection between climate change and the reparations discourse, and he is really um, offering up this perspective of what we need is a world building project that totally reconceptualizes human relations uh, at all levels. And to me, this was really uh, helped me to begin to understand the project of the worldwide Baha'i community as a world building project. And then thinking about the way in which this world building project of the Baha'i community inspired by the revelation of Baha'u'llah needs to draw from the discourse on reparations, which is taking place in a really sort of fascinating, exciting way uh, in, in the foremost uh, uh, of that sort of field of study, the foremost um, reaches of that, of that study. And you know, in our working group, one of the people who really helped guide us and nurture our thinking was uh, Guy Mount here. And, and he is, you know, he has thought about this perhaps more than anyone else in the working group and has some really wonderful ideas 
uh, that, as I said, helped me to really um, deepen my understanding of, of reparations, but not only that, to think about like what it means uh, to be involved in this project of world building that the Baha'i community uh, is embarking on uh, uh, right now it was really helpful uh, to be in the working group and to have the, the contributions of someone like Guy uh, there as well. So I'm gonna turn it over to Guy uh, to kind of take us through uh, some of his ideas. Oh, uh, th thanks, Derek, and thanks, June. And yeah, just uh, echoing the love and the just absolute uh, joy it's been to be part of this working group. Um, it's something that um, I'd kind of been uh, not knowing I was missing, right, until I came across it. Um, and it was uh, the way that I kind of came to reparations um, and uh, thinking about it was I was a graduate student at the University of Chicago, and I was part of the team, I helped found the team that uncovered the University of Chicago's historical ties to slavery. And this is at the moment when kind of Georgetown University, Harvard, Yale, Brown, all the other elite universities were starting to think about and reckon with um, on one degree or another, their ties to slavery um, with various conceptualizations of reparations, with, with various kind of political bents, different kinds of people taking uh, the, the helm of defining that kind of process and thinking about it that way. Um, and so I immediately got on the ground. I was also very involved kind of as an activist on the ground with labor organizing, with Black Lives Matter, with Occupy Wall Street. So I came to reparations kind of from an activist position and found there's been a long standing kind of tradition in black communities of activist work around reparations that you could historically trace back um, to emancipation, to the colonial period, to, to Africa itself in terms of conceptions of reparations, et cetera. But the work I was doing on the ground with organizations like NCOBRA, with organizations like Black Lives Matter, to kind of think through what reparations would mean in, in our case on the South side of Chicago, where a powerful elite institution was literally founded by a slaveholder, has an enormous endowment that simply would not exist without the labor of enslaved peoples, a university that had all also um, contributed immensely to segregation, had materially supported uh, redlining and challenges to uh, ending segregation. So you have this really bad actor in a lot of ways uh, that I was part of, right? I was, I was a student, a grad student at this university that needed to do some reparative work, that needed to make this right in some ways. And one of the baseline, I think, definitions of reparations is kind of to make things a right, to think about how do you set wrongs a right. And but what I realized and what I was always trying to reach out to Baha'i communities, I was involved in my kind of local Baha'i community, trying to get people interested, invite them to events. And it was weird. Baha'is were kind of standoffish about this, right? It was kind of like, well, you're talking material repair. And as Baha'is, we need to be doing the spiritual work. I'm all, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do all that together, right? There's a reason that the material and the, and the spiritual are interbound in so many ways in the Baha'i writings. And this could be an avenue through which um, we, can, we can do that. And so... Um, the one thing I noticed really quickly, and I'm gl again glad I found this uh, group because I was able to then think through and go back to some of the Baha'i writings that I hopefully can share with, with you guys in a second here um, and, and kind of uh, put those and synthesize those with some of the more, uh, for lack of a better word, secular activist uh, writings and scholarship that I was kind of familiar with. So I want to, if I could juxtapose two of those uh, in a second. Um, I, I'd like to do that. And the first is from uh, uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates, who June mentioned and, and Derek mentioned as someone who really renewed interest in reparations that um, had really been happening for, for many, many generations through an organization called ANCOBRA, um, which is the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America that actually has a, quite an international presence. They were part of the Durban campaign to declare slavery a crime against humanity, for example. They're very tied in with the CARICOM movement for reparations. So they're a US-based uh, Black organization that has really a broad, I think, international picture that, that Derek is kind of calling us to, to think about. And so they were a natural kind of ally for us kind of early on. Um, so they've been doing that work for years. The Republic of New Africa is where they kind of came out of back in the 70s. Um, but Ta-Nehisi Coates, this 2014 article, really put it back on the map in a lot of ways for uh, the, the general American public. Um, and Ta-Nehisi Coates, he's a friend of mine, he's a fantastic writer, amazing thinker, amazing scholar, historian. I've kind of uh, have been really, really blessed to kind of be uh, uh, able to learn from him. And, but he's, a, he's an avowed atheist. 
But even an avowed atheist, when he starts thinking about reparations, I want to quote from that piece, that 2014 piece, and have you think about what the process of, as Derek is saying, overturning the world, remaking the world, transforming the world, what just that process or a commitment to that process for an atheist like Coates, what does that mean for him? Here's what he says towards the end of, of that piece. He says, quote, what I'm talking about is more than recompense for past injustices, more than a handout, a payoff, hush money, or a reluctant bribe. What I'm talking about is a national reckoning that would lead to spiritual renewal. Spiritual renewal. So you have someone, an avowed atheist, one of the best thinkers, I think, of our generation, actually, and certainly one of the best writers, who's very careful with his words. He doesn't use a word like spiritual for no reason, right? He's thinking and conceptualizing reparations and saying the material is necessary. No one would deny that, right? These are, uh, I, uh, N. Cobra, for example, says we're done making the case for reparations. The case is made by Black history. Black history is the case for reparations. It, the case has been made. What we need now is to think about and conceptualize what that's going to look like. And you have Coates saying a spiritual renewal is a way to conceptualize reparations. You can conceptualize reparations as a spiritual renewal. I also want to quote from Baha'u'llah. So if that's kind of the, the spiritual angle coming from an atheist, I then want to take kind of maybe a material revolutionary approach that I see coming out of Baha'i text, the Baha'i scripture. So this is from Gems of, Baha of Divine Mysteries, um, page uh, 62. This is Baha'u'llah now saying, quote, he sounds very much like a revolutionary in the vein that you would more expect perhaps Coates to be, right? So Baha'u'llah says, quote, for it is indeed within the power of him who, the, who changeth the earth into another earth to transform all that dwell and move thereon. Wherefore, marvel not at how he turneth darkness into light, light into darkness, ignorance into knowledge, air into guidance, death into life, and life into death. It is in this station that the law of transformation taketh effect. So while I had been kind of engaged in kind of secular ways to conceptualize reparations as a permanent revolution, for example, it's one of the phrases that I've kind of thought through and really advocated for. How do we think of reparations? It's not hush money. It's not a payoff. It's not simply material. It's a permanent revolution, a total transformation, a world-making project, as Derek is mentioning. What Baha'u'llah is saying is that it's part of what I'm interpreting here as Baha'u'llah's law of transformation. So what would it mean to turn error into guidance? Just taking that one phrase from him and think about it in the context of, of reparations for slavery. Slavery was an error, right? Not in the sense it was an accident, right? But in the sense that it was an injustice, right? It's a very intentional injustice, this horrific uh, uh, institution that really made the modern world in so many ways, and that that extraction of black pain to transform that black pain into the wealth that built the modern world, it was an error in the sense that it was wrong, right? An intentional wrong, but a wrong nonetheless. What would it mean to take that error and turn it into guidance through a law of transformation? So I think the, stuff, the, the, the ideas, the concepts, the way to conceptualize reparations are there in the Baha'i writings. In some ways, you could imagine the entire Baha'i project as a reparative, restorative, transformative project where the world is going to be made anew. We're not going to keep these things from the old world order. We know the old world order is going to collapse. A new world order is going to be built up into its place. But what does that look like for descendants of enslaved peoples? What does that look like when the old world order has these vestiges of slavery that are still present in the modern world. And if we're not careful, we're going to drag those things into the next world. We're going to drag those injustices, drag those uh, inequalities, and, and drag those conceptualizations of the world into, into the new world or, or next world. Sorry, I muted myself there. Um, maybe it was someone telling me I'm talking too long already. But um, yeah, anyway, those are just some thoughts. Um, um, and some places to look, but I think this law of transformation in the Baha'i writings, I think, give us license to think about entering the discourse on reparations, which I think it's my, my rough take on where the kind of discourse is. It's very muddled right now, right? There's some really um, uh, 
cutting edge thinkers who are conceptualizing reparations in some really sophisticated, amazing ways. Uh, the one name we haven't mentioned is Fania Davis. Um, and Fania Davis, um, who we talked about in, um, she's the sister of Angela Davis. Um, we uh, heard some of her work. She has a great book on reparations that she's written, really tiny, very legible book um, called, I think, A Racial History of Restorative or Reparative Justice. Um, she thinks about reparations as a way of being in the world. That's one of her conceptualizations, right? Reparation is a way of being in the world. If you see a harm that's happened, repair that harm. If you harm someone, fix that, right? Make that right. If you didn't cause it, fix that, right? Heal those that have been harmed, find out ways to meet the needs of the people who has been harmed. And her rendering is that what reparations really are about are identifying who has been harmed, what the needs of those people are who have been harmed as defined by the people themselves, Right? The people themselves who have been harmed say, I've been harmed and I have this need that has arisen from this harm. And then answering the question, who will be responsible? Who will take responsibility for healing that harm? And you don't have to be the person who caused the harm to repair that harm. We do it all the time, actually, both as a society as well as individuals. Someone's hurt, the natural human inclination, I think, the best of the human condition is to help the person who's been harmed and figure out a way to make that happen. And if you've been harmed, right? It doesn't mean you can't help yourself, right? It doesn't mean um, you're waiting. It doesn't mean, as Coates is saying, there's some kind of a handout. No, right? This is saying, look, I've been harmed and I have needs and let's get together and, and fix these needs. Let's make this happen, right? Let's make the world new, transform things, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, um, just some initial thoughts and hopefully we can, we can keep, keep going. Thanks so much, Guy. This is really um, illuminating, and I really appreciate uh, what you've offered us here. Uh, also, June, thank you so much for your contributions here. And as you can tell, uh, if you've been listening to our presentations here, uh, the discourse uh, that we were able to cultivate within the context of the working group was really rich, and we're confident that it's going to lead us into um, you know, the capacity to articulate ideas about reparations from a Baha'i perspective with a kind of acuity and precision that um, we haven't had yet. And so this is a, a working process. We're learning as we go. And uh, we're just really excited to be involved in this. And it's been a pleasure to, to be in conversation with you uh, for just a few minutes, June and Guy, and um, look forward to continuing this in the future. Many, many thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for organizing this.